Well, anyway, let's, uh, let's go ahead and um, actually read this passage, and we're going to come back and visit it in a little bit. But 1 Corinthians uh, 11, starting in verse 23, uh, some very familiar verses about the Lord's Supper. And Paul writes, uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this, is, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the, bo of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, in order that we may, may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, Wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that, you, so that you may not come together for judgment. And the remaining matters I, Paul, shall arrange when I come. Well, let's go, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that, that periodically we may gather as, as fellow believers and celebrate, memorialize and celebrate that, that fact, Lord, that, that accomplished work on the cross, Lord. And we thank you so much that, that our Savior lives today. He is our risen Savior, Lord. And we uh, give thanks in his name. Amen. Well, uh, a while back, Kurt, as I told Kurt that I said, hey, I want to do the next, uh, I want to do the next Lord's Supper. Because uh, actually, wanna, I want to talk about some aspect of it that... Uh, really doesn't come up as a topic very much, uh, unless you've had experience with it. Uh, and so about a week and a half ago, uh, he asked me, hey, you want to preach when I'm gone? And I said, uh, I don't know anything to preach about. I was like, wait a minute. He said, why don't you preach about that thing you were telling me about uh, with the communion? I said, great idea. So what I want to talk about is uh, it's closed, uh, not trying to pick on you, Eric, but it's closed verses. <laughs> uh, not closed verses, but... Uh, it's the idea of a closed communion versus an, an open communion. Um, and again, this is something you might not even be familiar with uh, unless you've actually been in really both, I guess, is, is the idea. Uh, and I've had experience with both. Uh, well, let me just explain what they are. You know, what <laughs> closed communion? A closed communion, the idea behind a closed communion is that Communion or the Lord's Supper is only partaken of or only offered to or only given to members of a local of a local congregation. And in fact, specifically members in good standing, those that are not uh, under under any of the stages of church of church discipline. Um, open communion uh, or, or closed communion, I should say, is uh, it's, it's practiced by a variety of churches. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church practices, uh, yeah, you have to be a, a Catholic. Um, I believe all of the primitive Baptists and probably most of the missionary Baptists practice closed communion. Uh, some of the Lutheran synods practice, not all of them, like the evangelical Lutherans uh, don't, don't adhere to it. Um, and, and some, actually, some Southern Baptist churches. It's kind of up to the church uh, in that respect. Uh, so you really see that this idea of closed communion is shared or, or, or is found, I should say, should say um, across a wide spectrum of, of churches. Uh, some that, that I would uh, affirm to be doctrinally solid and some that I would affirm to be doctrinally out to lunch. Uh, so it's kind of interesting how this practice falls against a broad or over a broad variety of churches. The idea of open communion, which is actually what we practice here at Alvin Bible Church, is that 
communion is to be partaken of by anyone that is a believer in Jesus Christ. Anyone that ha has truly professed uh, to believe in Jesus Christ and know that they are saved by the blood of Christ is, is encouraged and welcome and included in taking of the communion. Um, so you see, there's, there's, <laughs> that's quite a contrast then between closed communion and open communion. And there actually is something kind of in between called a, called a close communion, which is the idea there is that a, uh, if you were of a like denomination and visiting another church of the same denomination and known to be of that denomination, then you could, uh, you could participate as well. And really in that respect, that's probably more where the Roman Catholic Church um, falls. Uh, so that's the idea then. And it actually, I mean, it is a church decision. And I'm not, uh, I'm not here to pick on any church that, that has a closed communion. I disagree with it, and I will give you the reasons why I disagree with it. Um, but it can, be, it can be a point of contention, and it's certainly not a point of contention here at uh, Alvin Bible Church, and we get that. Uh, but if you've ever been in a service uh, as a believer and not been served the elements uh, because you were not a, a, a member of that church, you can really get your feathers ruffled. Uh, and I'm going to tell you something, I've been there. <laughs> uh, I've been there both as a kid, which, uh, yeah, being a kid, probably didn't really catch the difference anyway. But uh, not too long ago, um, I had visited a friend's church on Sunday evenings uh, a number of times and uh, had, had James with me, as a matter of fact. It, uh, James and I sat through a communion where we were not served communion because we, uh, we were not members of that church. And uh, I, I think James uh, summed it up very well. He, he leaned over to me and he whispered, and he said, well, this is just awkward. <laughs> I thought, man... You got that right. <laughs> so I thought, you know, I'll just kind of talk about that idea uh, of, of the closed communion. Um, I want to give you the reasons that are given for it. Uh, and I'll let you draw your own conclusions. I'm certainly going to rebut those ideas. But again, don't ever take my word for it. Ponder it for yourself uh, and go with that. I, I will say, as I said in Sunday school, I try to make a sincere attempt to not come into something with, with, with an agenda but to come into it with, where does the word lead me? Uh, as a matter of fact, the church that James and I had visited, uh, I found it kind of interesting, and I'm really glad he did this. The pastor actually uh, gave all the reasons why they, uh, why they give a closed communion. And boy, I grabbed a scrap, piece of scrap paper on my Bible. I was writing them down as fast as I could so I could you know, go back and find those and study those later. And so this is exactly what I, what I want to do. Um, reason number one. Jesus communed in the sense of the Lord's Supper with his disciples only. Let me say that again. Jesus communed in the sense of, of, of the Last Supper, you, what you and I know is the Last Supper, with his disciples only. Therefore, the idea behind that then um, is that he, since he communed with what is taken to be his true followers only, again, I'm just kind of giving you some quotes here, um, that he communed with those that believed in him and, and were committed to fellowship. And so then the parallel today would be the idea that, well, th those that we know to be true believers and committed would be those that, that are members of a church, uh, members of a church because they have been vetted, so to speak, by, by church leadership, and the church leadership knows their testimony and knows that they are in fellowship. And, and so that's the idea behind that. Uh, so there's a parallel to that. Uh, so I guess you would look at, or, or someone with this viewpoint would look at his disciples as kind of equal to today's church membership. And you could go to the three, the three synoptic gospels and, and read that idea about the Lord's Supper. Well, okay, that's true. Jesus did partake or, or serve the Lord's Supper with his disciples only. There, there, there's no argument about that. There's quite an element of truth to that. Of truth to that. But the question is, how do, we, how do we get from that idea that because he communed with just the 12, and by the way, one of them was an unbeliever, but we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, because he communed with just those 12, how do we translate that to the idea then that only members of a church should be the ones with whom we commune. And quite frankly, I don't know how they get there on that. 
um, it's, it's an argument that is what we would call a, a non sequitur argument, literally from the Latin, um, it does not follow. So to say that he communed with his 12 disciples, or he did the Lord's Supper with his, he instituted, I should say, the, the Lord's Supper with his 12 disciples, and that directly follows to the idea that we should only commune with members of a church, you see there's, there's not a connection. I won't even say there's a strong connection because I don't see any connection at all. Again, it's, it's, it's non sequitur. How do you get from this? And it naturally follows that you, you get to that. Uh, the burden on the proof of, of the connection would be the one that supports this position. And that's something I did not get. It was not explained, and I've uh, researched it and have found no explanation for it. They just say that it is that it is. You know, it's kind of like saying, and, and this one does follow. I teach in a tech, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a public school teacher in a Texas public school. Therefore, I have a Texas teaching certificate. That actually follows because there's a connect that I teach in a Texas public school and I have a Texas teaching certificate. Now, what I didn't state was the connection in between and what is the connection. Even though it's unstated by me, there is a logical connection the state of Texas requires you to have a Texas teaching certificate if you teach in a Texas public school. So it does follow. But suppose I said that in Tim Klein, he's in property management, therefore Tim Klein has a real estate license. Okay. Well, he may or may not. I don't think he does. I hope you don't, okay? Because otherwise my argument's in trouble. But because Tim is in property management, and that's what he does, he's got to go around and knock people on the head, getting rent money out of them. <laughs> <laughs> and fix the messes that they make. Does it, does it follow, is there a logical connection that Tim Klein is, has a real estate license? Well, no. There's no, there's, no, there's no logical causation of necessity that's there. And so that's what I maintain with the fact that he communed with his disciples. It does not necessarily follow that we do a Lord's Supper with only members. In fact, I want to point out that when, when, the Lord's, uh, when that Lord's Supper was instituted, the church didn't even exist yet, and the Lord's Supper, even though it was given to the disciples, is clearly a church ordinance. It's clearly a thing of the church. He asked, then, what, why did Jesus, uh, and it's the only record we have of him of doing a, uh, a communion, and he did it with them, why, why, and, and that's true. I believe that, that that really is the case. Well, why with just them? Well, what, what were the disciples to him? They were certainly his inner, they were certainly his inner circle. We, we get that. And because of the fact that they were in the, his inner circle, what though, and, and Jesus Christ did fellowship with many, 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 many. And by the way, were the 12 the only believers? No. And were they, only, were they the only committed believers? No. Who showed up at the tomb? Some of the women, I mean, you know, they had to go get Peter. So the point is, there were plenty of committed believers, and it's true that the disciples were his inner circle, but the point is that they were his students. Amongst anything else that they were, they were definitely his students. And they spent years, three years that we know of, receiving instruction for him. And so the reason that he instituted the Lord's Supper with them was to teach them this, that they might then go out and teach that to others. It's really something we use in the school district often, which is a train the trainers model, which we will first train certain teachers that may have an aptitude or a desire to be a trainer of something, and then they in turn train other teachers. So there's a real logical reason why he did that uh, with them. His fellowship with the disciples didn't necessarily exclude the belief of others and Jesus' fellowship with others. We even saw Jesus' fellowship with unbelievers. And speaking of unbelievers, yes, you, you know, Judas was there. Well, I, I will say at least, if, if you do a lengthy comparison of the Gospels, it's most likely, it doesn't outright state it, but if, if you kind of compare what this Gospel says and this Gospel says in the sequence of events, Judas most likely left right before uh, the Lord's Supper was actually given. Well, I want you to turn to the uh, uh, book of Acts. We're going we're gonna to come back to Corinthians, so if you want to kind of keep your finger there and mark that, we will be back in that Corinthians passage. But turn to Acts chapter 2. 
And here is another reason given for sharing communion only with, or this is another passage, I should say, that is used. Uh, let's go to about 2.41, Acts 2.41. I think that'll get us there. This is yet another reason given uh, as to why communion should only be amongst members of a local congregation. I'm going to read from uh, about 241 to 247. Let's just read this. So then, uh, and recognize this is, uh, this is um, right at or very close to, uh, actually this is the, uh, the day of Pentecost, I should say. So then, those who had received his word, uh, Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost, were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. Uh, verse 45 now. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Well, amen to that. So, again, the argument, or the argument is this, that, that the day of Pentecost is an example in the early church as well, or examples of closed communion in the, in the idea that, first of all, it says those who, were, those who believed were baptized and added to the church. And we can at least say, yes, this is the first day of the church. The day of Pentecost, the bringing or the giving of the Holy Spirit to indwell believers actually does mark the beginning of what you and I call the church or even the church age. Um, so, some argue, there, there's two lines of argument that this takes. Uh, some argue that baptism is necessary for communion because that, that's what's seen here, is that they, were, they believed and then they were baptized and then they, they partook of the communion, the breaking of the bread. And because of that, church leadership, the, the leadership in a, in a given church, uh, a single church, can only ascertain that members have been saved. Uh, and that's, that's a lot of the thinking you'll see behind closed communion is that Really, because we know who our flock is, we, we know because members rightfully have to give a testimony uh, and that they agree to our doctrinal stance um, and that they get baptized or can testify that they have been baptized. Some churches actually require baptism as, as a condition of membership. Uh, that, that, you know, we can only kind of know really about those and everybody else. That's a little iffy. We may not know if they're believers. We may not know what their doctrine is. We may not know if they're really in fellowship. And so we have this example here. Uh, and and, and uh, the Acts passage says, of course, uh, all that believe were together and had all things in common. And they continued daily with one mind in the temple. And I'll come back to that and define what this idea about one mind is. Um, and, of course, the Lord was adding num by their numbers day by day those who were being, what? Saved. Uh, therefore, saved members of a congregation uh, should commune only with other members that, you know, that we definitely know to be saved. Okay? So that's the line of thinking. Um, that in really, especially verse 44, in all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, so that, that it really kind of begins to, to tighten up this idea of, of, of who the church is. Um, and I say, yeah. But I say, yeah, they got that part right. But I think there's another part you don't quite have right. But really what we're doing here, and you first of all realize that, that the communion practice is, is not even defined here. It says that they did it, and they, and they had communion together. Fair enough. But we certainly don't have here any, any outright command that... You need to have members <laughs> uh, participate in communion and exclude those who are non-members. Well, first of all, let me at least say in, in, in defense of this passage that, that the idea of membership it was not even an idea in view at this time. Um, 
I certainly think that there is a case later on in the New Testament for the idea of, of memberships or roles of a church, uh, because membership really is. It is an act of commitment to a local body. But obviously, I mean, this is the very first day of the church. Uh, I don't think that idea came in, and we really don't know exactly when it came in, but some of the later epistles, you do get the idea that there were membership roles. Um, but certainly not at this time. So we can't say that, hey, this is a clear indication of, of membership right here. It is a clear indication of something, which I'll get to a moment. But um, this one really kind of cracks me up uh, because of the fact that all those who had believed were together and, and they were a church, although we actually encountered the word church later on in Acts, uh, that, you know, that's why they communion together, because they were all that were saved, and they were all together, and we know that they were saved. Well, <laughs> I think the thing that makes me laugh is, about this, is that uh, <laughs> if you were going to go to church on this day, this is the church you were going to go to. There was no other church. This was the church. <laughs> this is the first day of the church. And for quite a while, uh, we don't know exactly how long, but at least for a year, uh, and possibly quite a bit longer, the church was the church, it was the congregation in Jerusalem. There was no other church. So of course they fellowshiped together. Of course they had the Lord's Supper together. So I really find that funny. Um, that, you know, I mean, it's the only congregation at that time. You wouldn't even have the chance to exclude somebody from another congregation. Now, would they have excluded a non-believer? Yeah, probably so, and I say rightfully so. I'm okay with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the idea of closed, com of closed communion. Um, it's just funny. I mean, everybody that was saved at that time, uh, saved into what we call the church through the work and person of Jesus Christ, believing in that, yes, would be in that particular, would be in that particular church. Later on, as uh, churches began, there began to be more churches and multiple churches uh, Paul gives us an insight into that, which we'll look at in just a little bit. Um, the question, of course, then might also become, uh, what, what, what about baptism? Uh, because it does say, so then, verse 41, those then, uh, so then those who had received his work, Peter's, the preaching that Peter had done about Jesus Christ, were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Well, that, that's fine. Some churches make baptism a, a requirement uh, for communion, and, and that's certainly their prerogative. Um, I don't agree with that. First of all, baptism is not a necessity of belief. I believe we are commanded to get baptized, but bab baptism is something that comes after belief. And when that comes after belief, I think is really up to the motivation and readiness of the individual believer. I think the point is, myself, um, I was actually not baptized uh, I believed as, as a young child. I believe in first believe in Jesus Christ as a young child. But I wasn't baptized until after I got married. Lisa and I actually got baptized together. She had been confirmed in the Methodist Church and realized uh, going to the, the Bible Church with me. And you know, we were talking one day. I said, "You know, Lisa, I've never been baptized. I feel like I need to be baptized." Um, and we actually joined uh, as a couple as formal members of that church at that time. And we we decided that that's a good thing we need to do. And we gave a testimony when we were baptized. So that that was kind of neat. But I mean, I went a lot of years before I was baptized. Was I an unbeliever? Of course not. Uh, I, w I was a believer uh, for many years before I got baptized. Um, so I, I do not find that as a necessity, uh, although I think the broader argument here is that, well, because they commune together, that we need to make sure that we commune with, with only known members. Well, it's kind of really funny. Look at verse 44. Look at Acts 2, 44. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. What does verse 44 actually define as the commonality? whether it be the breaking of bread or sharing things or, or learning doctrine together. Yeah, look at the first few words. And all those who had believed. <laughs> Works for me. <laughs> all those who had believed were together. That's the idea. Not all who signed a membership agreement or whatever it may be. Uh, so again, I'm not knocking membership in, in any way. Uh, Lisa and I joined 
as men, formal members of Alvin Bible Church uh, at the first instance that when we realized that after we had visited a number of times that, yeah, you know, this is where we wanted to be. Uh, so certainly I don't, again, see this as even weak evidence of the idea of a closed communion. I see, I, see no di I see no connection there. In fact, what I actually see is evidence of the open communion and all those who had believed were together and they had all things in common, which is including the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer and all of that. So another one that's given, um, and actually I, I kind of uncovered this one through research, is the idea of this. That the word communion in itself means fellowship. Now bear with me, I'm, I'm reading the argument. The word communion in itself means fellowship. And since the word communion means fellowship, and the Bible gives us clear commands not to fellowship with those of, of contrary doctrine, and, a church, uh, and since a church can only ascertain that, that its members are definitely of like doctrine, we therefore should then allow the Lord's Supper only with those in our congregation that are their congregational members. Okay, fair enough. Let, let's look at this point by point. Uh, the word communion in itself means fellowship, and, and that's quite true. The word communion uh, is a koinonia, which is basically the, the old Greek word for, for a commonality is really the idea. In fact, we actually get the word coin as money because that's the common medium of exchange from that. Um, it's translated in the Bible as fellowship. It's translated as partnership. It's translated as sharing. And it's also translated as, uh, as communion. I can't believe I forgot the word. <laughs> Um, so, so it has a wide variety of uh, translations, but the point is that it's all one Greek word. There's really one idea behind that Greek word, and it is a commonality. Now, in the beauty of the English language, we have many different words that are synonyms, yet each has a subtle variation on that. Uh, and that's why the King James translators and the NAS translators and every other translator has chosen to use a variety of words. Um, koinonia is translated in the King James Bible um, in only three verses. And I'm going to read them to you just so you have a, an idea of this. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 6, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 16. And you don't have to go there. I'll just read these. Is not the cup of blessing which we share a sharing or a, a communion or koinonia in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a communion, uh, NAS, a sharing, in the body of Christ. So there it's translated two times. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, and by the way, if anybody want, you want my notes on this, I'll, I'll be glad to give them to you. Um, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what communion, uh, the NAS uses fellowship, has light with darkness? And then uh, 2 Corinthians 13.14, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, as Paul was finishing out that letter. Uh, the NAS translate that, translate that as the, the fellowship of the, of the Holy Spirit. Okay, well, fair enough. It's true. The word communion in itself does mean fellowship. Um, and it's very true that in the Bible, we do have clear commands not to fellowship with those of con contrary darkness. So, at least what I want to say about this argument is, is this argument actually at least seems to be a sequitur argument. It seems to follow, okay, this makes sense, okay? There's clear commands not to fellowship with those that are, that are a, a, a contrary doctrine, okay, fair enough. And uh, since communion is a fellowship, we should not fellowship with them. Okay, fair enough. Well, let's go with that. Um, let me, let me read you a couple of those commands. You don't have to go there again, but uh, in 2 Thessalonians 3, uh, 14 and 15, Paul writes, If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So yes, don't, uh, don't fellowship in that sense of, of, of church things with, with one that's doctrinally contrary. Uh, 2 John uh, verses 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Fair enough. And uh, Romans 16, 17. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions 
and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. Okay, so fair enough. There are definitely clear commands not to fellowship with those of contrary doctrine. Now, we need to talk about contrary doctrine. What is it? We'll get there in just a moment. Something I certainly want to say about this is, is, is an idea for communing only with members of a church is, well, first of all, it was the King James translator's choice to use the word communion in these verses. So just the fact that they use the word communion that then becomes not a logical flow of thought because they certainly could have used fellowship, partnership, sharing, anything of those. Uh, we could technically define the Lord's Supper instead of calling it communion. I mean, that actually is, and we get it from the Latin, that, that's a choice that we use in our English language. Uh, yeah. Call it koinonia, if you really want to call it what it is. Call it the commonality, um, which, by the way, leads us to the other commonality. I'll, I'll get to in just a second. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that putting the Lord's Supper in a particular class of verbiage makes it therefore be some special class of fellowship. I really think rather than look at the Lord's Supper from the perspective of who was it designed for? And I think you can answer for this for me. It's designed for, yeah, the believer. That is absolutely right. That's the way we need to look at it not what particular class of, of word you could put it into. And I agree with Kurt. Sometimes, you know, you just, word studies are great, and going back to the original Greek, especially the grammar, is a huge help. But there's times we can get so caught up in word studies and so caught up in word meanings that it actually becomes a detriment. So uh, that, that is definitely a word of warning when we, when we appeal to the original Greek and, and, or, and or Hebrew. Um, I think the real idea then is in those verses I read about, do not associate with those of contrary doctrine. What is that? You have to arrive at a good definition of what contrary doctrine is. Because first of all, are you going to find believers agreeing on everything? No. And I think I've said this before. I literally, I went to somebody years ago with church uh, at Sandy Point who they had lit been in a church that literally had a split over which side to put the piano on. <laughs> <laughs> if you want it over here, that's fine. If you want it over here, I don't care. I mean, the things that schisms can, can occur over. But, but how, how do we, what, what's the commonality of the believer? I really think this one's very easy. It is the gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And everything that's immediately connected and flows in and out of that gospel, which is what? First of all, that Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God. He was truly a man as well. Um, we were talking about that in Sunday school. That he went to the cross. The Father dumped the sins of the world upon him. He paid in full for sin. He died. And on the third day, he was resurrected. I mean, that's the essentials out of which everything that we believe, you know, that's, that's what I guess it'd be called that the non negotiable. Okay. There's some other things that are probably closely related to that, yeah, such as the idea of the Trinity. I don't think how you could really believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and, and being truly God if you don't believe in the idea and accept the idea of the Trinity. So the point is that, that we can have a commonality with someone from another church, a visitor, or, or you as a visitor, whatever we do, if we're on board with the gospel. That's the main thing. Everything else, and certainly there are maybe some other things that are, are not real negotiable. I'm, I'm not going to try to go through a list, but there's plenty of things that are not negotiable. You know, I'll give one of the most stark examples I can think of is, is Kurt and I respectfully disagree on the age of the earth. Uh, I'm an old earth person. He's a new earth person. And that's fine. You know what? It does not hinder our fellowship and our commonality in Jesus Christ one bit. It actually sometimes makes for some lively discussions and provokes the, the thoughts of both of us. Uh, you know, and, and I have to say, if you were, gonna, if you were going to... So the idea then is, is in, in all aspects of... of true fellowship, yeah, we're going to stand at a distance with someone that does not believe in the gospel or has some very heretical things to say about Jesus Christ, such as that, well, he was only a spirit. He never was truly bodily. No, him being bodily Jesus Christ is definitely an essential part of the gospel. 
and, and I have to kind of, I'm kind of being facetious here, but, you know, if you're going to adhere with this viewpoint of, of, of a closed communion over the idea of fellowship, well, why do you stop, why do you stop at the communion, you know? Why don't you not sing with them? <laughs> why don't you not l learn the word with them? In fact, why don't you not even let them in the building? And why don't we put Tim Klein on the perimeter with his shotgun, you know, and we'll, <laughs> we'll just keep him out of here. So you begin to see if, if you're going to go at one point with it, you might as well keep going on with it. It just kind of becomes ludicrous. Um, turn back to Corinthians now. Uh, go back to Corinthians chapter 11. And we want to visit a couple of points here in, in Corinthians. Got about three more points here. I shall turn with you. Forgot to mark my spot too. And that's okay. Um, <laughs> Corinthians eleven eighteen. Which oh, I'm in Second Corinthians. No wonder it wasn't making sense. <laughs> like since many boast according to the flesh. No, that's not right. First uh, Corinthians eight uh, eleven eighteen. Let me turn one more page here. Yeah. Um, okay, th th I've actually heard this one in person. It says, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, and of course I'm reading out of my NAS, um, I hear that divisions or schisms, literally in the Greek, exist among you, and in part I believe it. And the idea that for in the first place, when you come together as a church. So the argument is this, that as a church refers to the local church and only to that local church, Therefore, it has to mean only members. Therefore, only members should partake, should partake, partake I should say, in communion. Well, let's just examine this briefly. Um, in, the, in the Greek, it's actually uh, the idea of uh, as, a, as a church. Certainly, there's a coming together. We get that, okay? As a church. Well, first of all, what else would they come together as, okay? Uh, it, when, when they're there. Uh, the, uh, in the Greek, it's ente ecclesia, and you know ecclesia is the word for church. Uh, it's the preposition in, which can mean, it, and it can be rightfully translated. There's actually a wide variety of translations for this preposition. One of the most predominant is, is our English word in, and it sounds almost just like it. Uh, te is the definite article, and I think, I think that makes a real important case here. Uh, so literally, the translation would be, in the church or as the church. But the point is, it's not a church. I don't know what the King, I can't remember what the King James says, but my, my NAS, they translated it with the indefinite article, uh. It's a very bad translation. When you come to things like that, cross it out and write the right word. It is in the church or as the church. Um, in either case, the definite article is involved. Okay, so the church is taken to be the assembly, and that's what the word church means anyway. And that was a Greek word in use long before our idea of the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, it was any assembly. But obviously Paul was talking about a, a gathering of believers. Um, I doubt seriously that it refers to the actual building when you meet in the church. Okay, That's not the idea in view. So then that leaves us with the idea that it is, Paul is getting at the idea when you meet as the assembly, when you assemble together. Um, and ask yourself, who would assemble? Well, again, we'd have no history or knowledge of where the Corinthian church was as far as the idea of membership at this time. It definitely came on later. We can find it later, but we don't know right now. Let's just assume that it was. Let's assume that they had, they had official membership roles and people that, that professed to be members and joined as members. Uh, who would be in this church? You would certainly find members. You would certainly find non-members. You would certainly find visitors. And you are most likely to find unbelievers in this as well. So Paul is saying, when, when all of you, whoever you are, come together, there is in no way that we can take this idea to mean that when you as a church, and that specifically means only members come together. You can't get there. Once again, it's it, the, the idea of sequitur that it follows is not there. It is certainly anybody within that church. Um, and the other thing that I think really gives this away is, is to what Paul is getting at and the fact that he does mean as an assembly is look what the verse itself actually says. Look, look at the context within the verse. Um, and it says, For in the first place, when you come together as the church, the church at Corinth, that's certainly what it means, 
I hear that divisions exist among you, and I, in part, <laughs> I believe it. Uh, so that's, that was really Paul's uh, purpose for, uh, for writing to that, is that the, that the idea was having divisions in it, not that we need to make sure that we're meeting as, as members necessarily, or, or really probably not, not at all. And again, I want to refer back to Acts, 22, uh, Acts 2, 44 that we had read. It defines the commonality of a church, and I think of any church, as those who had, and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. What? Those who had believed. Now, flip back a page. You might not even have to flip. I don't. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 17. Here's another little piece of support that's given for this idea of a closed communion, communion for members only. Uh, so uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 17. Mine's right here on the other page here. Uh, actually, let's read 10, 17, and 16. Let's go ahead and read that or look at it. Starting in verse 16, it says, Is not the cup of blessing which we, share, which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread or loaf which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? In verse 17, Since there is one bread or loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. And the, and the closed communion argument is this. Uh, that one body refers to the church at Corinth, since that's who the letter was written to, and that's true, it was written to the church at Corinth. Therefore, communion applies to the local church only. So only those of the local church, members, should partake. I'll say that again. One body refers to the church at Corinth. Therefore, communion applies to the local church only. So only those of the local church, that is members, should, should partake of, of the Lord's Supper. All right, fair enough. At least it's somewhat logical. <laughs> Where do we go with that one? There's a really important word that Paul uses in these couple of verses. Can you find it? It's just one word. I think it appears a couple of... Yeah, I see it at least twice. What does Paul say? Is not the cup of blessing which... Who blesses? We. <laughs> now let's think of the authorship of Paul in a letter to the Corinthians defining the body of all believers as we. I mean, it is crystal clear in my mind. Paul is transcending the local church of Corinth and looking at the broader collection of true believers, which is truly what the bride of Christ is, that's the true church. Yes, the church exists in multiple local forms, as I believe it should, local autonomous forms. But Paul is clear. I mean, it, it, I don't think it could be any clearer. We, <laughs> we bless, and then the other, we, got, we who are, verse 17, since there's one bread, we who are many are one body. When was this written? And where was this letter written? This letter was written by Paul when he, is, uh, when he, had been in, when he was at uh, Ephesus. And in fact, it was, written, um, it was written towards the end of his three years at Ephesus. And Paul had plans to get to Corinth because of all the trouble he was hearing that was going on at that church. But, I mean, the context of not only what it says with we, and, and, but the, the context of, of the writing, the authorship of this letter. Paul, who is at another church is not a member of a Corinthian church, is probably not a member of the church in Ephesus. He's a traveling evangelist and doctrinal teacher. He's probably not a member of any church, so to speak, uh, 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 in, the, in the human sense of it. Is writing a letter to another church in, in definitely delineating the commonality that they have through the, through the pronoun and, and the Greek pronoun. And it, 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 This verse actually just beautifully, literally translates from the Greek. Um, we. So I, I don't think that this one can really be, uh, be any, any clearer. Um, let me change my page on my notes here. So I, I understand that we is the body of all true believers. And what does Paul use to illustrate that body of all true believers? The elements of the communion itself. I cannot think of anything that unites true believers regardless of denomination 
or doctrinal stance on the, not, on the neg negotiable things other than the communion. It's a wonderful celebration that, that we partake of together. Well, I want to read you one more point. Uh, go back over here to Corinthians chapter 11 where we were. And look at Corinthians 11.27. Now, we've already read this passage. We read it when I started. But uh, 1 Corinthians 11.27, a real familiar verse. We, we hear it often uh, in our communion, along with the other verses. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty, or, or liable is a good translation out of the Greek, of the body and the blood of the Lord. And well, actually, verse 28 as well. So Paul warns and says, but let a man examine himself, and so let him, and so after examination, drink of the uh, bread and drink of the, uh, eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Actually, look at verse 29 and 30. Um, For he who drinks, he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, you know, here's the one that really kind of gets our eyes open. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. In other words, they've even been disciplined. In other words, because of this, uh, drinking of the cup in an unworthy manner, that many of them have been rightfully judged by God uh, unto serious appearance, apparently serious sickness, even unto death. Okay, So, the thought behind this is that because 1 Corinthians 11.27 invokes guiltiness and judgment on those who take communion in sin, therefore a church must not let those who are walking in sin partake in communion to prevent them being judged by the Lord. Okay, fair enough. Sounds pretty good. Since only members are known by the church leadership to be believers walking in fellowship, and that, that's, there's an element of truth to that, and, and not under church discipline, then only members per, can partake. And that's kind of the biggie that I've heard, is that, well, you know, in our local church, we as, as the deacon board or the elder board or whatever it may be, you know, we, we know who the believers are that are believers because they've joined as members and they've professed their belief and we know that and because they're accountable to us under church discipline we know who's walking in fellowship and we know who's not therefore that's who should partake of, of the lord's supper so really what's happening is there's this there's this fence being put around the lord's supper and believe it or not in in scottish circles there have been times and there may still be in certain denominations where there literally is a fence around the lord's supper you had to have a ticket to take of it because you had to be in you know known person in fellowship well i want to look at this a little bit closer um, because it sounds pretty good this one sounds fairly logical um, but but th but there's an issue with this we tend to think of this as um, those who are drink, uh, those who are partaking of the Lord's Supper with sin on their heart, and that is actually not the issue that Paul was getting at in this. If you back up to verse uh, same chapter, if you back up to verse um, twenty one, Paul writes this. Um, well, actually, in verse seventeen, he says, "But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse." You know, and there's divisions and all this, and then jumping down to verse twenty one, for in your eating. Each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, <laughs> even worse, another's drunk. <laughs> he says, what? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. You know Paul had to be a tough guy to deal with, <laughs> but he was a straight shooter. The context of this is then, and you have to look at the broader context as well of, of, of the Corinthian church and Paul's purpose for even writing to them, um, is that this was a church of disorder. I mean, uh, this church had a lot of dysfunction and it certainly had a lot of sin in it. But specifically, they were engaging in their Lord's Supper in a, in a very irreverent and disorderly manner. One thing they were doing is actually were combining it with their so-called, what we would uh, refer to as their love feast. Uh, which actually was a true dinner like we would have over here, but they were combining the Lord's Supper with it, which is very problematic and was very problematic. They were showing up drunk. Uh, people were showing up and eating everything before anybody else got to eat. You know, just, just, just chaos. And, and as well within this church was the idea of social hierarchy and that, that uh, those of better means and standing in the community were, were definitely 
treated preferentially up to and including the Lord's Supper. So that's the context of what Paul is saying when he says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy, in an unworthy manner. Uh, that he's talking about chaos and disorder at the Lord's Supper. Now, by the way, just as an aside, I want to point out that um, when this was originally translated by the King James translators, they kind of didn't get this one right. And my NAS, if you have that, has copied it as well. Uh, the Greek does not say in an unworthy manner because it, that makes unworthy out to be an adjective that's describing manner. Um, and that's not what it, because then it begins to sound like, well, I partake of it as a sinner, okay? That's not what Paul was saying in the Greek. It's actually um, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily. It, in the Greek, it is an adverb, which is actually describing the manner in which you eat or drink. And that's why the King James translators chose to use to translate it the way they did. But it really, they just should have said, eats or drinks unworthily. And by context, we understand unworthily to mean in a disorderly manner. Now, certainly sin is involved in that. I, I get that. Uh, but it's not talking about just general sin in our life. This is specifically talking about to be orderly and reverent within the Lord's Supper. And I, will, and I will say this, and, and I know Kurt and Tim would agree with me, that we're not here to define who takes the Lord's Supper and who's not, other than to say it's believers. If you have sin on your heart, that's your business. Um, and that I encourage you to, to go before the Lord uh, in, in that, because sin on our heart affects all our areas of, of fellowship. Um, I will certainly say that, that, it, that is, is the leadership of this church. What we certainly would be on guard for is that we all do not partake of the Lord's Supper in a, in a chaotic and disorderly manner. Certainly, that's our job. Uh, but look, what, look, look who Paul puts the onus and puts the burden on to partake in a worthy manner. Verse 28, But let a man or a woman examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and eat, drink of the cup. And then if you, you, know, you read the rest of it, that you know, some of y'all are being judged. Your church as a whole is not being judged. Some of you individuals are being judged. So definitely the burden to approach the Lord's Supper in a correct manner, in a reverent manner, is upon the individual believer. But at the same time, like I said, and, and really I think any time we get together, it, it is, a, it is a, a responsibility of the leadership to make sure that things are just not chaotic and crazy. That, that's for sure, but I think that extends to all things. Um, so it's definitely uh, upon, upon the uh, individual, and, and we certainly should examine ourselves. Now, have we ever seen that in Alvin Bible Church? Not, not that I can ever recall. I don't recall Billy Glines running up here and being all crazy and pushing everybody else out of the way and you know, getting his element. So... Thank y'all for being good brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> um, j j and also, as a side note, you're wondering, you know, what does it mean to be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord? Well, you know, that's what the cup and, and the bread, that's what the wine and the bread represent, the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. And it seems to be the idea here that to, to, to take of it in an ir irreverent manner is really to dis is really to disregard the very real thing that's behind these elements, the very real thing that Jesus Christ did. I mean, it's really almost to take on the attitude of the world about Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, really a mocking and irreverent. I mean, it's, it's really acting like an unbeliever, and that is serious business in certain cases before the Lord. I think a really strong parallel that exists for this idea uh, is back in Acts when Ananias and Sapphira lied, uh, lied to everyone, including the Holy Spirit, about how much money they got for the land that they sold. And when it was discovered that they had actually lied and kept back some of the money, and yet they had said, this is what we bring for everybody. I mean, they dropped dead on the spot. There's just certain instances where God says, my church is serious business and we're not to mess around. 
certainly lying in the early, early church. I mean, that got everybody's attention. Uh, and this is one more case uh, where it would. Well, the bottom line is this, you know, open or closed communion, does it matter? I say absolutely yes. Um, and this is why, you know, communion is a commanded, we read it right here in uh, these verses in, in, in Corinthians. Communion is a commanded ordinance for the purpose of, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Who should do this? Well, I think the real clear answer is believers, all believers, all church believers, all, all true church believers, uh, uh, what I call the universal church, which is what you and I would probably best call the, the bride of Christ. Uh, you know, and, and I think the problem, th there's two problems I find with the closed communion and why I really, you know, seriously disagree with it. Um, and again, obviously, it's not a problem in this church. I just want you to be aware of it. If you ever have experience with it, it's really not a very pleasant thing, as, as James and I could tell you. Um, is that, I mean, there, there is no clear command that, in the absence of a clear command to do the communion in that particular way, um, it really places a layer of legalism over and above the Scriptures. And I think that that's something that that, that we should, well, first of all, it, it creates the potential for excluding a believer from taking communion, and that is something that I am loath to do in this church. There is no way I would ever want to exclude a, a true believer, someone that's put their faith in Jesus Christ, from partaking of the, of the communion. That is, that is their prerogative and their right. I mean, it's really not Alvin Bible Church's Lord's Supper. It's the Lord's Supper. It's His, and it belongs to all believers, is my, is my opinion. And then again, as I was saying, I kind of got myself out of order. Um, in the absence of a clear command to, to have members only, it really is placing a layer of, 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 of human legalism and human ideas over, over the Scriptures. If there was a clear command in the Scriptures to do it, then we would do it. But, but they're just, uh, they're simply, there simply is not. And that's why if you look on our website, uh, we could probably pull you up a paper document as well. In our little section of our beliefs, we have this. The Lord's Supper is the shared remembrance for all believers of Jesus' substitutionary death and the hope we, and the hope we, you want to go get them, Lisa? Or, would you mind? Uh, Children's Church. Uh, and the hope we have in Him. So it's right there, uh, uh, essentially in one of our doctrinal statements, that the Lord's Supper is the shared remembrance for all believers of Jesus' substitutionary death and the hope we have in Him. Uh, Tim and Gary? With that in mind, we will actually just roll in. Uh, Y'all stay up here for just a second. Uh, we're going to roll right into the uh, Lord's Supper. Lisa went to get the kids for uh, Children's Church. But, um, so, let me state this in case I didn't. We at Alvin Bible Church practice an open communion, which means that if you have put your faith and your trust and your belief in the work and person of Jesus Christ, that you claim Him as your personal Savior, you believe Him to truly be the second person of the Trinity, yet at the same time to truly be humanity, now in His resurrection body, because He died on the cross for your sins and He was resurrected, and He now awaits in heaven to come back together His bride to Him, then you are... Not only encouraged and more than welcome, you are exhorted to partake of the Lord's Supper. If you do not find yourself in that position, examine yourself and please talk to Tim and I or Kurt when he gets back. Uh, go ahead and serve the elements, guys. I'm going to read to you all from uh, Psalms 111 while they pass that out. I thought this to be a fitting passage. And then we can take a little time of self-examination if... They don't beat me to finishing. Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. In the company of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. Splendid and majestic is His work. And His righteousness endures forever. He has made His wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He has given food to those who fear Him. He will remember His covenant forever. He looks at that cross, He looks at the sinful believer, and He remembers that covenant. 
He has made known to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are truth and justice. All his precepts are sure. They are upheld forever and ever. They are performed in truth and uprightness. He has, I love this, he has sent redemption to his people. He has ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. I think we timed that just about right. (laughs) Again, if you need to take some time to do some self-examination, please do. And there is never any shame, by the way, in not taking the elements of the communion. It just means that that tells us that someone has some serious self-examination to do. Uh, Tim, would you go ahead and pray for the, uh, for the bread? Let us pray. Lord, as I come before you to, uh, today, Lord, I, uh, I examine myself, Lord, and I find myself short of uh, the biblical description of where we should be. Yet, Lord, I am comforted by the fact that you uh, have forgiven me of my sins, Lord, and that uh, you've invited me into fellowship with you and uh, that you sent your very Son to die on the cross for my sins. And this bread... Uh, this morning can uh, remind me of the fact that his body was broken for me and uh, for all of us Lord and I just uh, I come uh, just uh, humbled and grateful for for your love for us in this act and I pray this in your name amen Um, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me let us partake Gary, would you pray for the element of the cup? Father God, we thank you for the day that you've given us. But more than that, we thank you for Jesus who came, lived, he sacrificed himself. And before, as he stood before the the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples that were with him, Lord, he knew what was ahead of him. And he knew that he was going to shed his blood, not only for them, but for all of us. We thank you, Lord, that you made that provision for us. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much that uh, we have an, uh, an ordinance, an awesome picture of what happened on that cross. And as Gary and Tim said, Lord, that we have a Savior that died and bled for us, Lord. And the good news is, and when we celebrate this and remember it, we also look forward until the time that He comes for us. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Eric? Y'all stand as we sing the song. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly